Thank you for tuning in to Changing Lives at Crossroads. Get your Bible and join Pastor Tom Pennington with today's message. The Loss of the First Estate Noah Series, Part 2 It's good to see all of you smiling today. That means I, the Lord did a great job last week keeping you content in your spirit. <laughs> Well, praise the Lord. Well, we're going to continue our study in the uh, book of Genesis uh, concerning the, the days of Noah. And we're also going to look at other various scriptures. In fact, we'll be looking first in 2 Peter and also the book of Jude. So let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And as we read these passages of Scripture, I want us to think about what we've already read and talked about real briefly last week concerning, the, as in the days of Noah, to um, kind of refresh this. We're going to be titled this study, the lost, the lost of the First Estate. And you say, what does that talk about? Well, I'll hopefully answer that question and, uh, through the Scripture so you have an understanding. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into change of darkness to be rest, reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah. Now, there, we, we, let's just kind of give us a, a kind of a, a beginning there. God did not spare the angels who sinned. Keep that in, in part of your thinking there. In Jude, verse 6, it says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode he reserved into everlasting chains under the darkness for judgment of the great day. Father, we're asking that you will give us insight to the word, Lord, that today we will be knowledgeable and then we'll be able to hear what you're saying to us through the Spirit. Lord, open our ears to hear, our mind to understand, and let our heart become fertile ground in which the word takes root and grows. Lord, help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. As before we get started, I'd like to just say this again, that we, we, we read this last week, and that um, if we have not knowledge, the people are destroyed. If, if, if the people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so again, this is a learning time for all of us to kind of put pieces together to where we can begin to see the full picture of what kind of the days of Noah were like. Uh, we're going to entwine that again, like I said last week, with what's happening today, what happened then. And uh, we're going to put the, the pieces together, and we're going to begin to see it all come about. Because uh, I really believe that we are very close to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the Word says that as in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man appears. And so uh, I believe that things are taking place, that moving that direction, that indicate that. And so we're going to try to put pieces together so we, the church, the people of faith that are in this place, will have an understanding so we will not be broadsided by unexpected things, that we'll be able to know the signs of the times and begin to say, this is what God's Word says. I'm ready for it. And not be afeard. Amen. That's what I tell my wife. Don't be afeard. <laughs> you know? We have hope. We have promise. We have the Lord. Amen. And uh, so don't, don't think this is some non, non cynical things or made up stuff. Is we, again, referring back to what the preacher said in Ecclesiastes, what has happened in times past is happening, will happen again. Amen. And so with that in mind, let's look at Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. We've already read Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and Jude verse 6. And this is why it was written, and here's the cause for it. Now it came to pass, this is Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Uh, I just want to clarify a couple of things here. Uh, I honestly believe that the sons of God, and I think Scripture will back this out, the sons of God are angels. They're the messengers of heaven, and all through the Scripture, they're referred to at various points as sons of God. There is another viewpoint that says that these are the, the sons of God are the offspring of Seth, which was a righteous line. 
uh, that is not true. In comparison to what we're going to read in the scripture, uh, it gives a false impression that a righteous man married ungodly women. <laughs> or, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's a true statement. We're all of sin and come short of the glory of God. We're all wicked without Christ. But in this particular passage of Scripture, in Genesis chapter 6, these will be referred to in our study and how we unfold the Scripture is the sons of God will be angels that have fallen. And, and we're going to look about the fall a little bit today to kind of give us a, a background. Uh, if you're looking for a quick release or a quick expository on this lesson that we're having over the next few weeks, just get a pillow. We're going to be in this a while. Just so we'll know and understand what the Scripture says concerning these things. And then uh, we'll, uh, I, I just want you to be aware that this is not going to be something that we're going to just rush over. But we want to be able to understand it. All right, Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 talks about the sons of God, and they are angels. In Job chapter 1, verse 6, and in Job chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now that same scripture is found in both those things I just mentioned, verses chapter 1, verse 6, chapter 2, verse 1. It's the same, same wording. And that refers to the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? They're the angels. They're the, the created beings that God created. And angels are mentioned in the Bible, in the Old Testament alone, 108 times. Angels are mentioned 165 times in the New Testament. And the word angel comes from a Greek word, angelos, meaning messenger. So when we see the angels appear, they come with a message, most, most generally. We have Gabriel that came with a message to Daniel. We have the message uh, that, uh, 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 to Joseph and, and to Mary. That was Gabriel's responsibility. We also find that there was a messenger angel that came and spoke to the, uh, the parents of Samson uh, out in the field and told them what they needed to do and how to get ready for Samson's life. So angels do appear as messengers. The Bible also says in the book of Hebrews that we need to be constantly aware in our entertaining because we may entertain angels, right. unaware, so to speak. Uh, angels can take on human form and likeness, and they, can, they live in a different dimension. We, it's a dimension we can't see or enter into, but they, they have the ability to come out of their dimension and move into ours and reveal who they are in, 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 a, in a form. Uh, what are some of the angel groups? And we'll just kind of give you an idea. Most of us know seraphim. And then we find the seraphim found in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And we find that Isaiah is in the temple, and the, the glory of the Lord fills the place. His train fills it. It's just filled to capacity. And there are seraphim that fly. They have six wings. With two they hid their face, with two they hid their uh, feet, and with two they did fly. And everywhere they went, they said, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You know, it's a, it, they were angels of worship, and they're angels that guard the way uh, to the, they, they serve as God's caretakers to the throne. They're what you call the imperial guard, you might say, some have said. So just to kind of give you an idea, they are angels that speak the praises of God in eternity. These are wonderful angels. I don't know what exactly from what we just gathered, just the, what they look like. I, I'm looking forward to the day when, in eternity when we can see these wonderful uh, servants of God uh, in, in, in their form. The next group of angels that we find are cherubim. And cherubim will play a vital part in our study because Satan himself was a cherubim. And so we'll look at him in just a few moments. And cherubims guard the way of the tree of life. In the garden, according to Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, that when uh, Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden, the Bible says that God sent a cherubim there, and he had a flaming sword. And it kept them from entering into any aspect of the garden. Uh, there's also times in the scripture we'll find that they give a little more descriptive look as well. In fact, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 28, and we will get a little bit of picture here. In Ezekiel 28, verses 14 through 16. And this will give us a look of, of what the cherubim kind of look like and part of their responsibility. Uh, Ezekiel 20, 
8. If I can get past Isaiah, we'll be in good shape in Jeremiah. Here we go. Yes, Ezekiel 28, 14 through 16. And the scripture says this. Well, this is talking about Satan himself. Let's look at it real quick, though. This talks about uh, Satan, the picture of who he is. You, you are the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. Uh, you were on the holy mountain of, of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were, cre cre were created until iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. And therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. So we have a little picture there of what Satan kind of looked like. He was a covered cherub. He had the ability to walk in and out of the fire of God and move freely. But he was also covered. If we go back into verse 11, we will find that, moreover, the word of the Lord says to me, this is verse 11 of chapter 28 of Ezekiel, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, and this is a picture of Satan himself, thus says the Lord, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect, beauty, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Think about that. Every precious stone was your covering. Uh, the sardis, the topaz, the diamonds, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald and gold. The workmanship of your timbrels. That's the, the vocal cords. Uh, that some said that Satan was the, the one that led the praises of God throughout the, all, all of heaven. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were created. Wow. Uh, you know, so that, that gives us a kind of a, a bigger picture of this individual called Satan and what a... He looked like as the anointed, covered cherub. We also find another group of angels, archangels, and we also find that Michael might be is an archangel as well as possibly Gabriel. Also guardian angels, host of angels. Uh, these are just various groups of angels that we see in the scripture. Uh, living creatures found in Revelation and also the 24 elders. Uh, these are individuals that are considered angelic hosts or beings. But what is the first estate of the angels? That's what we want to kind of get into. Uh, the first estate, you know, because the Bible says, we read it in Peter, that they left their first domain or their first estate. What was their first estate? Why were the angels created? What was their purpose in being created? And the angels were created for worship and for service. You know, and that's something that we need to really consider uh, in our own life as well. We find that when they would, one picture we find in the scripture is Isaiah 6, verse 3. We've already read it a little bit where they cried one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Angels were, were created to worship the living and almighty God from eternity to eternity to eternity. Put an, is there an end to it? No. When you look at Revelation, you find the four and twenty elders, you find the four living beasts. Continually, they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they gave out praise and worship. So we find that the angels of heaven are a, a worshiping body. Well, that in, it gives us indication of what heaven is going to be like. Yes. It's going to be a church service. Right. It's going to be a time of praise and worship, a time of adoring and honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. King of all kings and Lord of all lords. We're also, uh, I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 5, and let's look at verses 8 through 14, and then also chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. But in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 through 14, we see this picture revealed to us by the writer John, and he says this, Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures... And the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and, a golden, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayer of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals. You were slain. You have redeemed us to our God by your blood. Out of every tribe, every tongue, and people, and nation, you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Verse 11. 
And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them were ten thousands times ten thousands times thousands of thousands. Innumerable. So we find that there's going to be an innumerable host in heaven of angels, and their purpose is to worship God, to give Him praise. Remember the occasion when the choir came down from heaven on the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? And they said, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. This is the purpose of the angels, is to worship God and to be the messengers of God or the servants of God in proclaiming the tasks that are needed for us to, to fulfill even. You know, God does use angels even today. I've never met one that I know of as being an angel, but who knows? I might have met somebody that I thought was a real person but would turn out being an angel. That's a very possibility. And so uh, there is the, that it, God does use angels still today. He did all through the Old Testament. He did through the New Testament. They came and released Peter from prison. Uh, the angels led the children of Israel uh, into the promised land and helped them secure the, the victories uh, that they had mentioned in the book of Judges as well as the book of Joshua. So we find that the angel of God is always working uh, to uh, give glory and honor to the Lord. Turn with me now to chapter 7, verse 11 and 12. This is another passage of Scripture that gives a picture of the angels glorifying and singing before the Lord, uh, declaring His praise. Here's what it says in seven, chapter 7 of Revelation, verse 11. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and, the, and fell on their face before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. You know what amen means? So be it. That's right. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. amen. And, you know, this is a continual picture that we see about the, the angelic, being that they are creatures of praise and preachers of service. They are doing the purposes and will of God. Over the last probably 20 years or so, there has been a move among this society to have angels in our house, and pictures of angels, even angel names you know, written out on plaques and different things. And we take those angels and we put them on our house and we put the names on there and we call their names out. And sometimes we even refer to them as our guardian angel. Let me tell you something. Angels are not to be worshipped or revered or adored in any way, shape, or form. They are a created being. They are not God. So you don't pray to angels. You don't call their name out in reverence or anything. They're, in, they're just servants of the Almighty God, just like you and I are. So don't ever pull, pull their name out and say, I'm going to worship, I'm going to call upon the... Michael or Gabriel or Raphael, you know, those are, th th those are just names. They're not God. God is the one that needs to be worshipped. And if you look at the picture of the Bible, God is worshipped. The Lord is worshipped. He is exalted above everything else in heaven and in earth, under the earth. All of creation is declared by the angelic host, worship God. And I say that to us today. Worship God. Don't worship any other being. Don't worship anything else. Worship the Lord. And if you have pictures of angels, be careful. You know, don't put them in that point of focal point. Just remember, God is the only one to be worshipped. Because when you start worshipping angels, you start rebelling. Because, and you'll be led into a long road of deception, a false light. This is what happens in the New Age, in the challenger, the, those who challenge, or not, not challenge, channeling. You know, they, they're, they're out there and they get all these people, these angelic names, and they say, oh, these people, are, these angels are going to come and they're going to save us and redeem us. Let me tell you, God has already sent a redeemer. And his name is Jesus Christ. You know, so don't believe what these new agers are saying and, and these uh, uh, kind of faulted, uh, uh, these occultic groups are saying. The worship of angels was introduced by an angel himself. In fact, his name was Lucifer, and we've already read a picture of what he looked like. He was perfect in every way. 
He was a beautiful creature. He was God's orchestra leader, musician. He was the highest cherub, anointed, covered cherub. Highest cherub in the ranks. You know, God had, the angels of God do have rank and order. That's how we are ourselves in, a, in our race as, a, as mankind also established rank and order because God established it all from the beginning. And so there is rank and order. And Lucifer was the highest of the ranking angels and had the special place. But he had something wrong with him. Yes, he, did. he liked it when he walked by other angels and they acknowledged him as the covered angel or the, the covered cherub. He liked to hear his name declared. And the Bible says that he was perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him. That iniquity was pride. In chapter 7 of of Isaiah, we find the picture, or chapter 14 of Isaiah, we see the picture. Let's read it real quickly so it's just refresh us. We've, in fact, on a Wednesday night a few weeks ago, we covered this a little bit, talking of pride. But here's what we find in Isaiah chapter 7, chapter 14, excuse me, chapter 14, verse 12 of Isaiah. It says this, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. And the, there, the, the stars of God also is a picture of the angelic host. Uh, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And boom. God says, I can't handle it. That won't be here. And he was cast out. There were, he got, Satan led a rebellion against God, and he was cast out, and one-third of the angelic hosts were cast out with him. Where did they go? Down. Down to the earth. They were cast out of heaven. They went down to the earth, to other places that we may not know of, but we know they were cast down to this place because the scripture gives us that picture of it and reveals that to us. And when they came, as we see going back to Genesis chapter 6, we find that these angels that were cast out going here and there roaming around the earth, that when they saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, desired them. Now remember the first estate or the first place at the, or domain of the angel, their purpose was what? Worship and service to God. Angels were not designed or created to uh, enter into any kind of relationship with any other creature. They were designed for one purpose, and that was to, for worship and for service to the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we see here in the picture found in Genesis chapter 6, that because they were cast out, and, you know, when they were cast out with Lucifer, who had sin in his life, guess what happened to those one-third? They, too, also had sin in their being because they rebelled and disobeyed God. And so they're no longer holy, majestic, or pure angels. They have sin, and they have a rebellious nature. And so we find that in this passage of Scripture, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, that when these daughters of men were born, that the sons of God, the fallen angels, those that were cast out, they saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took to them for, for themselves uh, wives of all they chose. And this is part of the plan of Satan to corrupt the seed that, he, that God promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Hold your finger in chapter 6, and remember what the promise was, uh, that God said, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, or her seed and your seed. And her seed was going to be the seed of the Messiah. Talking of Eve, from the, God already had a plan. Remember, from the very foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. So we know that God had a plan of redemption already in place to redeem those who have sinned. 
on this earth. God sent ahead a plan to redeem mankind. And so the seed, the, the, the Messiah would come from the seed of the woman and the seed of corruption or the seed of Satan, which will be very something will, that will play a vital part in this last day, is going to be a seed of mixed seed of angelic and human. And that's what caused the great sin found in chapter 6 of Genesis, that they left their first estate. That's why it says in First and Second Peter, it says in Jude, that they are bound in eternal darkness till the day of judgment because they left their first estate. They did that which was not for them to do. I want to read something out of the book of Enoch. And I told you last week that we're going to reference this book occasionally. And so uh, I'd like to read just a couple of things out of here in this same event of Genesis chapter 6, just to kind of give you... The reason I'm picking on the... Uh, pick out the book of Enoch, did you know the book of Enoch's mentioned in the Bible? Yes, it is. As well as the book of Jubilees and some other books. And so if these books are mentioned in the Bible, it's imperative or important for us to put them in place to help us in our study. Because they relied on them as a historical account as well. And this is what we're going to use it for in our study. This is what it says in Enoch... Uh, chapter 6, And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied in those days, there were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wise from among the children of men and beget us children. So they knew they were in violation of what they were created for. Uh, there's an angel named S. S-E-M-J-A-Z-A. -A. I can't say it. For, for Jazza? So Jazza. Well, who was their leader? Said unto them, I fear, that, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this, indeed, this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered and said to him, Let us all swear an oath and bind ourselves by mutual uh, appreciations. And not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear all, they all together and bound themselves by mutual agreement upon it. And, there, and they were in, in all 200 of these angels who descended in the days of Jared on the, mount, on the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they sworn and bound themselves by this mutual oath. And it goes on to say in chapter 7, and all the others came together and took them un wives unto themselves. Each one chose for himself one and begat to go into them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms, enchantments, and cunnings of roots and made them acquainted with plants. They became pregnant and bare great giants whose height was 3,000 eels. And that's like a, a cubit. Uh, who consumed all the acquisition of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. The earth laid in great lawlessness. Now this is a picture of what happened when the angels that fell came and began to uh, couple with human race. Not only do they couple with human race, they begin to manipulate the DNA and genes of plant life, animal life, which we just read here in the book of Enoch, fish, reptiles, everything. And so they begin to, to corrupt the entire creation of God. Remember, one of the plans of Satan was to destroy the seed of the woman. And so you find that the women are very much a victim of their plan, but also all of creation. Is, a, is being corrupted. We also find in the book of Romans that the, all of creation is crying out and looking for the day when the sons of righteousness will stand. Yes. That's us. Yes. You know? Creation is looking for that day. And so we find in, that God has, God's creation is being totally destroyed by a plan initiated by Satan himself that his seed will, will come against the seed of the woman. And Satan's plan is to destroy that seed. 
So the angels lost their first estate. If we read on in Enoch chapter 8, and we also get pictures of it also in Jude and back in Peter, that these angels are bound in darkness, they're bound in change, and they're waiting for the day of judgment. In fact, we said it already, they're cast into hell, which is Tartarus, which is the burning fire. And they are waiting for that day of judgment. But it also, I want us to see a picture of man's lost estate. Just for a moment. Because we are victims of a sin nature. And that sin came because of the fall of Adam and Eve. In the beginning, we were created, man was, perfect in the image of God, in the likeness of God. Man had domain, domain over all of God's creation. And Eve, along with her husband Adam, were able, were able to till the ground and do what God wanted them to do until they were tempted. And they yielded to that temptation. And they lost their first estate. Remember, they were made in the likeness of God, but because of their disobedience, they lost that first estate, that likeness of God, and they became a corrupt image. Man's DNA was corrupted from that moment on. And so we find that God said, I'm going to send a redeemer. I want to send my son, Jesus Christ. In the book of Romans, we find that the second Adam was sent. Paul gives a good, a good a writing account of the first Adam and the second Adam. And so the, the first Adam brought death and destruction. But the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, brought life and restoration. You know, what, God, what Satan intended to destroy, God has a remedy to restore. And that is something we need to remind ourselves that we're, no longer, we're not, we're not going to be haunted or, or victimized by the sin of this world, but we have a Redeemer who has given us His life's blood to free us from the, 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 the results of sin and the, 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 the torments of sin. Jesus Christ came to free us from all those things. The Bible says that He became a curse for us and He broke the curse over mankind. Hallelujah. So we ourselves are being brought back into our first estate through the, per, per the, through the person in the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us not forget that. It is Jesus who restores us to God. Hallelujah. And as we continue this study over the next week or two, three, I want us to always remember that we have a Redeemer. We have someone who is on our side. It's gonna, we're going to see some ugly pictures of what's happening back then. It's happening today. But always remember, we have a Redeemer. And His name is Jesus Christ. Let's stand together, please. Lord God, we thank You for the blessed Redeemer. We thank You for Jesus Christ your son, who gave himself so willingly and freely for our redemption to break the curse of sin over our life, to free us from its power, that we may walk in the likeness of God, in the victory of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that today you will just place that spirit of, of trusting you. Father God, let it be a strong trust, that we no longer be fearful, but we no longer be afraid in any way, shape, or form, but we are trusting you for everything in life for we know and we believe and we confess that you are coming soon and we want to be a people that is ready a people that is trusting you at all times lord help us to share your love your grace your mercy your message with those around us and lord we give you praise for that in jesus name amen Wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow, no other fountain.
loved I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, the days of Noah are going to be coming. And some of these events that we're looking at are going to be happening again. And let me ask the question for someone who may be here today. Do you know Christ as your Redeemer? Do you have a promise? Do you have the hope that His Word declares? If you don't have that hope and you don't have that promise and you don't know Jesus, I want you to make that decision today for Him. He is your Savior. He will save you from the wrath to come. He, is, he will redeem you from the power of sin. And He does it today. He does it today if you'll let Him. We're going to sing the chorus one more time. And if God is speaking to you and you want your sins to be covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, you come and we'll pray together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great afternoon. See you tonight, 6 o'clock. Yeah. Welcome our missionary from China, Ben, and say hello to him. And greet each other in Christ before you go. God bless you. We trust today's message was a blessing to your life. You can reach Pastor Tom Pennington at Crossroads of Albuquerque Ministries at 5200 Marble Avenue, Northeast Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87110. Or call us at 505-837-1414. Donations are greatly appreciated. A list of DVD and CD sermons is available upon request.